Good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Justin Gaynor. I'm the director for the Center for Thoracic Cancers. And it's really my uh, pleasure to, to welcome you tonight um, for all of you joining from, from home uh, to our session entitled New Strategies in Lung Cancer Innovations in Clinical Trials, Treatments, and Patient Care. Uh, this is a, an event that, that dates back several years. Um, and it's changed formats uh, to reflect, obviously, the, all of the changes uh, that have gone on in the world. Um, and, and we recognize that uh, we, we, we all wish we could be together in person because part of the, the, the reasons that made this, this event so special was the ability to, to actually interact face to face. But we are, we're trying to, to do whatever we can to embrace technology and actually bring this to a, to a broader audience. One of our goals tonight is, is to educate our, our audience on what the changes that have been taking place in thoracic oncology over the last year. And I'm, I'm really proud to say that there's really been transformative changes, many of which have been driven here uh, at MGH. Um, and, and also to provide a, a platform for us to talk to you about the future of thoracic oncology and the future of thoracic oncology here at Mass General. So joining me tonight, uh, I have four fantastic panelists, uh, Dr. Piotrowska, Dr. Lynn, Dr. Dagogo Jack, and Dr. Sequest, and I'm going to introduce um, them all uh, in the next few minutes, and they're all going to touch on, on a different aspect of thoracic oncology. But to really set the stage, I wanted to talk about four themes that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and these four themes are, the first one is drugging the previously undruggable, two, understanding resistance to therapies, three, combination strategies, and four, uh, trying to identify biomarkers of response. Now, I recognize that many people have different backgrounds in our audience tonight, and so I wanted to just take 10 minutes to give you an overview of how we think about thoracic oncology and what are some of the broad um, you know, advances that, that have taken place. I think it's reasonable to start here though, um, and really just to give you a sense of how far we've come. This was the, the treatment algorithm for uh, the management of advanced lung cancer in 2002. And you can see it was pretty straightforward. It was just you know, pretty much everyone getting the same sort of therapy. Now fast forward to the current treatment of lung cancer and you know, we could even tease this apart even further, but it's gotten very, very complex and multiple different uh, types of treatments. Now, Two of the, the major treatment modalities that have really fundamentally changed that whole approach from that one, everyone gets treated the same way, to this really diverse array of different therapies uh, are these two major treatment strategies that are targeted therapies and cancer immunotherapy. Now, these are, these are quite different modalities. We think of targeted therapy as really uh, genetically sequencing a tumor and trying to pair a targeted therapy, usually these are oral drugs, against a particular genetic change. By contrast, immunotherapy is really trying to stimulate the body's own immune system to identify and attack a cancer. And really in both of these spheres, we've seen amazing advances over the last several years. This is just to show you all of the FDA approved targeted therapies in lung cancer. And you can see how, how things have really sped up since 2011. And the same can be said for cancer immunotherapies. These are all of the FDA approved therapies over the last several years. And what I'm proud to say is that just this year alone, we have 10 different FDA approvals in thoracic oncology. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to say that uh, MGH has played a pivotal role in many of those approvals, and I want to highlight some of those in the next few minutes. So to begin with in drugging new targets, I, I wanted to highlight some of the work by one of our colleagues who won't be joining us tonight, but we wanted to highlight her work. This is 
from Dr. Rebecca Heist. Um, this was work published in the New England Journal of Medicine just a month or two ago. And this was pivotal work uh, leading to the FDA approval of a drug called capmatinib for alterations in a gene called MET. This is the first targeted therapy specifically for MET alterations in lung cancer. So this is a big advance and really increases the number of targets that we can now attack in lung cancer. Likewise, uh, just within the last three months, uh, we now have two FDA approved RET inhibitors. Uh, this is targeting a different genetic change in non-small cell lung cancer. And MGH played a role in the uh, FDA approval of both of these agents. So this has been incredibly exciting going from first identifying this genetic change in 2012 to now seeing the first FDA approvals for these drugs. In parallel, you know, I think a key recipe of our success has been not resting on our laurels and, and trying to understand how resistance to these therapies evolves over time, resistance to targeted therapies. And, you know, tonight you'll hear from, from two colleagues who have led a lot of the work on EGFR resistance. So Dr. Sequest and Dr. Piotrowska. And this is just highlighting some of the pivotal work uh, that, that they published now two years ago alongside our laboratory collaborator, Dr. Aaron Hada. Fresh off the presses, uh, you know, the, the same approach now has been um, basically applied to different genetic alterations. I mentioned that RET drugs were just approved, uh, you know, within the last three months. And just this past week, we now have one of the first broad descriptions of resistance to those drugs. Uh, this was published by Dr. Lin and colleagues. And really the, the key for trying to understand resistance is then informing what we do next, informing new therapies. And I think nowhere is that best exemplified than in this next, next example. And this is work from Dr. Dagogo Jack, who you'll also be hearing from tonight, you know, and Aaron Hada. This is uh, work in out positive lung cancer, another one of those subsets of lung cancer, trying to, where, where Dr. Dagogo Jack identified that a subset of patients acquire new alterations in that same gene called MET. And uh, this is relevant because it leads us to our third theme, uh, which is to not only understand what's happening with the resistance, but then to try to exploit it. And I think this is really uh, you know, demonstrated well by uh, a study that Dr. Dagogo Jack is now leading here at MGH, which is really testing different combinations of targeted therapy. So historically, we, we use one targeted therapy at a time. This is an example of really where she's taken the insights on resistance and designed a, a clinical trial testing three different combination strategies. And we really think that combinations are gonna be the wave of the future moving forward. And then to round things out, you know, um, I haven't, I've largely focused on targeted therapy right now, but I did wanna say a major effort for our group moving forward is on cancer immunotherapy. Now this is a broad, broad term. And I've already mentioned that the, the overarching principle is you're trying to stimulate an immune response um, uh, that, that already exists, but, but is somehow being blocked by the cancer and, and its surrounding environment. Much of the progress in lung cancer has been really with respect to these immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, this is really where you see all of those FDA approvals over the last couple of years have all been with respect to these immune checkpoint inhibitors. Now, despite the tremendous promise of these drugs, we recognize that they don't work in everyone. And that's been a major frustration and a major challenge for the field. And so one of our really uh, quintessential efforts right now is sponsored by a Stand Up to Cancer uh, lung cancer dream team. So we're, we're at the center of this lung cancer dream team, where we're really working across many different institutions, which many of them you, you see highlighted here, trying to understand what are the predictors of response 
to these immunotherapies by leveraging all of the basic science um, and laboratory collaborations that we have here in this very rich environment in, in the Boston and Cambridge area. It really is a perfect environment to study things like this. So um, just to summarize be before I go on and, and introduce my colleagues, um, just to, you know, this was meant to be a very high level overview, but to illustrate that targeted therapies and immunotherapy have transformed the management of lung cancer. And uh, MGH has really been at the center of these advances over the last decade. And so as part of our program tonight, we wanna to highlight how we think about the challenges ahead and outline plans moving forward and how uh, our audience can get involved in those efforts. So uh, with that, you know, I, I want to pause and, and start uh, introducing my colleagues, and I'll begin with uh, Dr. Zosha Piotrowska. Dr. Piotrowska is uh, an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and a thoracic oncologist, and her emphasis of research is on uh, targeted therapies in EGFR mutant lung cancer, as well as uh, an evolving interest in small cell lung cancer and the intersection of those two things. So I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Piotrowska to, to provide a brief overview of her work, and then we're gonna have time at the end to uh, ask questions of everyone, everyone on the panel. Great, thanks Dr. Gaynor, and thank you to all of us, um, to all of you for joining us tonight. I know, you know, it's certainly been a challenging year for, for everyone, and I know many, many people, and many of my patients in the clinic will frequently ask, you know, how has all that has happened in 2020 impacted clinical research, and, you know, and we still need new treatments. Is lung cancer research still gonna keep moving forward? And I, I think the first thing that I wanna say is just to provide reassurance that, we know that it's been a challenging year, but but we also know that that there's so much need out there for improved and better treatments for lung cancer, and, and we are all committed to continuing to work in this very, very important area. Um, and we thank you all for your continued support and, and for being here tonight. So I think one of the, the themes that I wanted to highlight is, although each of us will talk about kind of a, a particular area of interest, there's also so much overlap between many of the things that we're gonna talk about. And I think one of the great strengths of our group is that we really work together to learn from our respective areas of interest and, and to try to learn from, from other fields to, to make sure that the discoveries we're making can impact the broadest number of patients. So I'm gonna talk about both targeted therapies in EGFR mutant lung cancer and some of the advances that we are making there and also touch on small cell lung cancer and, and in some ways actually two areas that used to seem quite distinct EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancers and small cell lung cancers. And there are areas of overlap between these as Dr. Gainer alluded to. So first to talk about some of the, the advances that we've made in the area of improving treatments for EGFR mutant lung cancer. And I know that there are many of you in the audience who have a particular interest in this area. And we have you know, both a, a clinical and lab-based interest and, and really strong track record of moving the field forward. Of course, MGH was one of the institutions that helped discover EGFR mutations back in 2004, and it's incredible to see how far we've come. We now have five different EGFR inhibitors that are approved by the FDA, and the newest one, osimertinib or Tegriso, is the one that we most commonly use as our first treatment. But I think the area that we want to look forward to is how can we improve upon that standard of care? How can we do even better? And we have many clinical trials ongoing looking both at ways that we can treat cancers that have become resistant to osimertinib. We have a number of different trials in this space now, including a multi-arm study called the ORCHARD trial that's really looking at how do cancers become resistant to osimertinib and how can we use different treatment strategies to personalize treatment after osimertinib resistance and, and develop the most effective therapies for each individual patient. We also have other new treatment strategies that are, that are in clinical trials, including some new drugs that we're very excited to be able to bring to our patients, um, such as the, there's a um, drug called U31402, which is a new kind of um, antibody drug conjugate that we just had opened a new clinical trial with, and many others that are upcoming that we're, we're looking forward to offering to patients. We're also looking at ways in which we can develop improve first-line treatment strategies, so new combinations that we can use to do even better for patients who are newly diagnosed with EGFR mutant lung cancers. 
And all of these efforts wouldn't be clinical trials at all if we didn't have a close collaboration with, with partners in the lab. And Dr. Gaynor highlighted the work of Aaron Hatta in the lab, who was a very important collaborator in all of our research. You know, patients generously provide biopsy samples, plasma samples to us in our clinic, and we are able to then take those and work with Dr. Hada's lab to develop cell line models um, and other models. We, we look at deep sequencing of these samples to try to understand how does resistance to targeted therapies develop and how can we develop the next generation of treatments. And I think that's always been an area of great strength and, and a big area of our research, and that continues. You know, the lab is up and running. Those samples are still being brought there every week, and we continue to work in that space. One of the um, important discoveries that has been made through those efforts is the discovery that a subset of lung cancers that have an EGFR mutation that start as non-small cell lung cancer actually undergo a transformation from a non-small cell lung cancer to a small cell lung cancer. And this is one of those areas where we actually see a marriage of these two different kind of areas of, of lung cancer meeting. And this is an area that I have a great research interest in to try to understand this phenomenon and develop better treatment strategies, both to treat patients who undergo this type of change in their cancer, but also to understand why this might happen and how we can prevent it from developing. And this is an area where, where we're working not only here at MGH, but also with collaborators around the country. This is relatively rare. And so we think that each institution is gonna have a hard time studying this, this phenomenon, but by working together with many other collaborators, we can really understand it better and develop treatment strategies to overcome these types of uh, resistance mechanisms. Finally, just in the last few moments, I, I think, you know, small cell lung cancer is, is another very important area to highlight and has been, as many of you know, a huge challenge in the treatment of, of lung cancer and an area for years that we didn't have a lot of progress. And it's really exciting to see that just like in non-small cell lung cancer, we are starting to see progress being made in small cell lung cancer, both with respect to immunotherapy, as well as other new treatment types. And, and so we have ongoing clinical trials for patients with small cell lung cancer, both ongoing and upcoming. And we have a very strong um, program again in the lab with NIH research funding to collaborate both with Dr. Hata and Dr. Dyson to study these um, small cell lung cancers in greater detail. And I'm also excited to say that we have a, a new postdoc that's recently joined the lab that's specifically interested in, in studying small cell lung cancer, both as a resistance mechanism to targeted therapies and as a, as a, as a challenge in and of itself. So I think there's so much to be hopeful for both in GFR mutant lung cancer and in small cell lung cancer. And we're really excited to see what, what all of these different projects will bring in terms of new treatment strategies for our patients. Thanks so much, Dr. Pietroska. That was terrific. Um, I, I forgot to mention at the very beginning, if people have questions, I would urge you to, to type them into the question and answer uh, box on your Zoom. And uh, we, we want to make sure that we actually have half of, of tonight's session uh, devoted to questions. So, so please feel free, if you have any burning questions, just enter that uh, into the Zoom question and answer feature. So next I'm going to introduce Dr. Jessica Lin. Uh, so Dr. Lin is a thoracic uh, medical oncologist uh, within the MGH Center for Thoracic Cancers and an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And Dr. Lin is, is really an expert in targeted therapies focused on oncogenic fusions, uh, specifically ALK, ROS, and RET fusions. And uh, she's actually leading the national ALK master protocol, which is looking at incorporating uh, targeted therapies in uh, based upon uh, understanding of resistance mutations after someone has already been on one targeted therapy. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lynn, and she can provide you a, a brief overview of her work. And then we could dig into questions after everyone's had a chance to introduce themselves. Thank you, Dr. Gaynor. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to have you join us this evening for this special event. Um, and we're very glad to be able to do this virtually this year. Uh, thank you for attending. As Dr. Gaynor mentioned, my work with the group is focused on lung cancers driven by oncogenic fusions, and this includes ALK and ROS1 fusions. And so we have a number of ongoing research efforts on identifying novel treatment options. And with that goal in mind, also better understanding what drives resistance to the existing therapies and how to improve upon those uh, responses. 
At Mass General, as some of you know, we've been really a key part of driving the advances in developing ALK and ROS1 inhibitors, and we continue to work on bringing new clinical uh, trials of the most promising, exciting targeted therapies um, in the upcoming years for ALK and ROS1 lung cancer. So this year, we had an uh, active accrual to the trial of Reputrectinib, which is a novel ROS1 track inhibitor. And next year, we anticipate that we'll have at least two new trials of novel uh, therapies for ALK and ROS1 kind of targeted therapy. In fact, our efforts to uh, understand resistance mechanisms to existing inhibitors has really paved the way in informing the development of the newer compounds that we're seeing now, in addition to drug combinations. We have very active translational research efforts, as you heard about from Dr. Piotrowska, um, parallel efforts in the ALK and ROS1 space analyzing resistant tumor specimens at not just the targeted NGS level, but also whole exome and whole tr transcriptome level to really understand the biology. And also generating cell line models and mouse models from patient-derived tumor specimens as well, which then serves as a tremendous valuable resource for testing uh, uh, new inhibitor compounds, for example, and performing additional cellular uh, molecular studies. In order to expand our reach with these research efforts, we've developed, as an example, a new clinical study called Enigma Plus, which is for ALK positive lung cancer patients. And this study is really designed in order to enable the remote virtual consent and participation of ALK positive patients from across the nation, even those patients who cannot reach the Mass General Center physically. And the goal is that with this trial, we would be able to collect and study tumor samples as well as medical treatment histories of a broader population of ALK positive lung cancer patients so that we can better understand the genomics and immune phenotype of ALK positive lung cancer. This study will be open um, and actively accruing patients within the next couple months. And so we, with this study, we are hoping to elucidate the immune biology of ALK positive lung cancer and really harness that new knowledge to hopefully open up immune-based therapies as a whole additional class of therapies for our ALK positive lung cancer patients. Aside from developing um, ALK and ROS1 inhibitors, as Dr. Gaynor alluded to, we are really working on understanding how to, how to optimally sequence the existing therapies. And so many of uh, patients with ALK and ROS1 rearranged lung cancer are treated with one inhibitor after another in sequence. Um, and it is really important to understand what's the most effective sequencing strategy. So one way to study that is with the ALK master protocol, which is a national NCI NRG sponsored phase two trial. And this is looking at the question of how we can utilize rebiopsies at the time of cancer progression and molecular testing in order to hopefully inform subsequent therapy selection. So again, this is a large study with uh, several key investigators and Mass General is one of the leading sites for this study. I think looking ahead for both ALK and ROS1 and other fusion-driven lung cancers, one of the major challenges and, and, and opportunities um, will be to uh, figure out how we can really sustain treatment responses in patients and also to address target independent resistance, which is a major area where we're um, needing more novel therapy options. And so to that end, we are working very hard on combination strategies, which is one of the areas of focus for Dr. Dagogo Jack, and she'll talk more about this in much greater detail. And also through studies like Enigma Plus that I mentioned earlier, where we are hoping to open up immune-based strategies for as a treatment option. And so we have a lot of exciting studies in, in fusion-driven lung cancers, and, and hopefully next year, this time around, uh, we can share newer updates. Great. Th thanks so much, Dr. Lin. That, that was a terrific overview. Um, so next is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dagogo Jack. Uh, Dr. Dagogo Jack is a thoracic medical oncologist uh, at MGH, as well as an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And uh, she's really been leading a number of different efforts. Uh, you just heard about one of them, which is 
um, trying to look at combination strategies uh, for patients with out positive lung cancer. And we're, we're going to be excited to hear about this trial that she's going to introduce, uh, as well as really trying to take some of those same less lessons that we've learned in out positive lung cancers and apply them to other types of uh, genetic alterations and other types of uh, tumors. So um, she's also focused on looking at BRAF mutations in lung cancer. So this is a, a particular alteration that affects a small subset, but it, um, uh, it can be very sensitive to targeted therapies. And then lastly, uh, she's going to talk a bit about mesothelioma, which is a, a different type of cancer that can affect the lung, the surrounding of the lung. And I think this is really an area where uh, we really are, are expanding a program dedicated to the management of mesothelioma. And Dr. Dagogo Jack's been a driving force of that. So with that, I'll introduce Dr. Dagogo Jack. Thank you, Dr. Gaynor. And as my colleagues have said, it is really a pleasure to be here and we're happy that you could join us today. So central to everything that we do, and I, I think it's a, a point of emphasis, is a kind of a overarching goal of improving outcomes for our patients. And I think that the, that will be hopefully made clear when I discuss the combo trial that has been referenced by several of my colleagues. So this combo trial, I think, is really a testament to uh, decades of research, basically over a decade of research at MGH and partnerships between our clinicians, our laboratory scientists, and our patients. Because a lot of, a lot of the combinations uh, actually arose from what we think of as N of 1 experiences or kind of observations from our patients who developed a particular type of resistance that prompted us to look broadly at other patients to identify that these were recurrent mechanisms. And I think that this is one of the things that MGH can, is uniquely positioned to do. And what I mean by that is investigator-led trials. And so many institutions participate in sponsored trials where a pharmaceutical company develops a trial and multiple institutions can participate in. But at Mass General, we're, there's a commitment to advance the science and kind of move our scientific observations forward into the clinic, and that, that is a premise of an investigator-initiated trial. It's a unique platform that allows us to pair drugs that are made by different pharmaceutical companies if we think that they're the best strategy for our patients. And so this combination trial is actually the combination of one of, it's in the ALK, for ALK positive lung cancer, and it's pairing one of our most effective ALK targeted therapies with several other drugs that we think are more likely are most likely to kind of block or impede the so-called what we call out independent resistance or mechanisms that cause cancers to eventually become resistant to targeted therapies. This is a very, we, we think it a very ambitious and a very promising protocol that we're uniquely positioned to run here at MGH really due to kind of decades of, you know, collaboration and commitment between and strong partnerships between our laboratory scientists, our pathologists, as well as our patients. And so this is a trial we look forward to and we've already uh, have already kind of accrued many patients to the protocol and, and we look forward to working with more patients and if anyone has interest in the study. And I think that as Dr. Gaynor mentioned, one of the, you know, one of the hopes with our observations is that we can apply them to other subsets of lung cancer. And BRAF is a subset of lung cancer that is more recently discovered. But I think that, you know, at MGH, we're uniquely positioned to conduct BRAF research because BRAF was actually initially detected in a different type of cancer called melanoma. And a lot of the pioneering work in BRAF and melanoma was led by investigators in our melanoma group. And so there are laboratory investigators and kind of clinical investigators committed to this type of, this particular subset of cancers. And we've been able to borrow some of the lessons learned from those types of cancers and apply them to lung cancer. And through those lessons, we've been able to kind of lead, be at the leading edge of the newer targeted therapies and the newer clinical trials that we hope to bring in the coming year that are looking at even better uh, targeted strategies for BRAF, mutant lung cancer including drugs that improve the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier so we can better treat our patients who have brain metastasis, and drugs that are, have kind of the mechanisms that we know may drive resistance in mind. And so that's an area of excitement. Another area that I wanted to highlight is mesothelioma. 
And so mesothelioma is a, for those of you who may not be familiar with the disease, is a disease of the lining of the lungs called the pleura. To date, we don't have a lot of therapies for mesothelioma. So that slide that Dr. Gaynor put up, where you saw that kind of a linear progression for every patient, where you only had one or two options for therapies, that's where we are with mesothelioma, but we hope that we can apply the same strategies that we've applied to lung cancer to really advance that area, to advance uh, therapies for mesothelioma. And so we already have kind of robust laboratory uh, collaborations that we're building, partnerships with industry to study on a large scale to this rare tumor type. And we also are uniquely positioned again at MGH in that we have a kind of a burgeoning, blossoming uh, cellular therapy program led by Marcella Moss, where they actually are developing cellular therapy products or CAR T cells to target a protein that is expressed at high levels at, on mesothelioma. So our hope is that we will be able to kind of use this rich network that we have at MGH and across kind of Boston and our partner in institutions to really build up programs that can transform the care for mesothelioma patients in the same way that you've seen and you've heard from my colleagues is in how the care for ALK positive lung cancer and EGFR positive lung cancer has been uh, transformed. So thank you. Great, Th thanks so much, that, that was terrific. Um, so up until this point, you know, we've largely focused on advanced cancer and we recognize that really the holy grail is to identify cancer earlier where we're able to intervene um, faster in, in an ability to completely eradicate a tumor. And so it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, tonight Dr. Alicia Sequest, who's the director of the Center for Innovation in Early Cancer Detection and the Landry Family Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and a thoracic medical oncologist in our group. And she's done so much uh, over, over the last several years, both with respect to targeted therapy, but also she's really leading our efforts on early detection. And so tonight she's going to share with you some of the work that's ongoing here in the Cancer Center. So Dr. Sequest. Thank you, Dr. Gaynor. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. And I'm just scrolling through the list of attendees and thinking about how many friends and, uh, you know, basically members of the, our MGH family are on this list and how we normally get together at this event every year and um, see each other face to face. So I echo prior sentiments that we really missed you. We miss seeing our community. We learn so much from our advocates uh, and um, we're glad that you could join us by Zoom, but we still miss you. <laughs> Um, so I have two passions in my research. Uh, one is EGFR mutation lung cancer and Dr. Pietroska nicely summarized a lot of the research that she is leading and that uh, we have led together in this space. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you about my other passion, which as Dr. Gaynor mentioned is early detection. So, you know, in the big picture, we are helping lung cancer patients live longer. We as a field, uh, there was an amazing publication in the New England Journal of Medicine just a couple of months ago showing over the last decade, the improvement in survival for lung cancer. This is a disease which really didn't have much of a change in treatments um, strategies and in outcomes for, you know, 50, 60 years prior to this most recent decade. And now we're really starting to see that some of these discoveries uh, and this cutting edge science um, is starting to make a difference. And uh, I think that this first improvement in, their, in survival was probably mostly due to targeted therapy. We're expecting uh, future improvements in survival with the advent of immune therapy. And I think lung cancer screening and early detection is also going to make a huge impact. So together, these three areas, I think will really turn uh, the tail of lung cancer around into a different story. Um, but uh, lung cancer screening is really still in its infancy. Currently, we use uh, chest CT scans to screen for lung cancer. And um, this was thought to be futile uh, 15, 20 years ago, um, but newer, newer randomized studies have shown that not only does it help detect cancers at earlier stages where it can be more easily cured with surgery, but also that it can improve survival for the population that, is, um, that undergoes screening. So this is a really important component of any successful screening test. 
Um, at MGH, um, our radiology department is fantastic, and they started implementing a lung cancer screening program now uh, probably close to five years ago, and it's been growing and growing, um, and, and, and we're now screening um, uh, you know, hundreds of patients uh, every month for lung cancer. Patients who have a suspicious finding on the screening test are being sent to our multidisciplinary nodule clinic, which is run by one of our colleagues, Dr. Inga Lennis. And here they can really get a very um, nuanced opinion about how to best treat um, an early stage lung cancer. So all of that is a really good starting point, but some of the problems that we still have to tackle are one, a large number of people can't even get access to the screening test because it's restricted uh, both by age and by smoking status. And so we know that there are people who don't meet the criteria who will get diagnosed with cancer and we have to find better ways to help detect their lung cancer earlier. We also know that the x-ray or the CAT scan that I described is not a perfect test. Um, it picks up a lot of things that aren't cancer, and sometimes it misses things that are cancer. So we have launched um, a new center called the Center for Innovation in Early Cancer Detection. It's not so new anymore. It's close to three years old now. And this is a research center that tries to marry the newest types of technologies with early detection of cancer. And so, for example, in lung cancer, we're trying to figure out how we can make our CAT scan screenings better and also how we can reach a population of patients that can't get access to the CAT scans using technologies like blood-based markers, uh, breath-based markers, both what you exhale and also we're developing along with some scientists at MIT a way to inhale a marker into the lungs that would metabolize and maybe could be detected in the urine on a, a stick, like a pregnancy stick, whether or not there may be cancer after you've inhaled the marker. Um, and we're also working with computer scientists to try and um, implement artificial intelligence or machine learning to better interpret people's risk for lung cancer. And our ultimate goal with that project is that maybe um, adults of a certain age, regardless of smoking history, could get a baseline CT scan, which could be interpreted by a computer to tell what is the future risk of lung cancer over the next 10 years. And should this patient uh, be followed more closely for potential lung cancer screening, even if they're a never smoker, but they have high risk features um, that the computer can pick up that the human brain can't necessarily process. Um, or even if it's a smoker, is this someone who is actually at low risk for lung cancer and may be able to have a more um, uh, a, a screening strategy that takes a step back and is not so intense every single year. So this is the type of thing that we're trying to develop in our center. And many of you on the call have been um, supporters of our early detection center. And I thank you so much for your support. Um, we've, uh, we've come a long way. We've made a lot of collaborations. Uh, we've published our first paper on a blood-based biomarker, um, CTDNA, in the journal Nature this summer. And um, we're really excited about uh, the work there. Thank you. Great, Th thanks so much. Um, so we, we have about 20 minutes left for questions and, and we actually have multiple questions coming through the, the Zoom. Um, and I'll, I'll begin with, with um, one that's kind of in some ways the, the elephant in the room, which is you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think there's been a lot of concerns, appropriately so, from patients, their families about, you know, can they continue to access things like, you know, clinical trials? And so, hey, I'll throw this out to Dr. Sequest, you know, can you tell us a bit about how uh, our center has responded and, and uh, you know, how, how clinical trials were maintained during the pandemic? Sure. Um, the pandemic has, has impacted all of us, patients, caregivers, uh, providers in so many ways, whether it's um, dealing with the day-to-day -day safety of how do we get through our day, remote schooling, there's so many factors, but I think we're all so proud that um, 
at, at MGH, uh, we not only were able to help the overall hospital and really take care of an additional large number of patients that were suffering from COVID, but we continued our cancer care um, without many serious interruptions, and we continued to offer patients access to research um, throughout the entire, you know, we had our first um, surge in the spring here in Boston. We may be heading into a second surge, but I think that everyone is very, uh, very dedicated to work together to make sure that the cancer patients don't um, receive anything less than uh, world-class care during this time. Thank you. Um, one of the, the common questions that come up, um, so maybe I'll pose this one to Dr. Piotrowska. Um, so one of the questions has to do with um, someone is on a targeted therapy, say osimertinib for EGFR mutant lung cancer, and eventually it stops working. Um, and there's interest in, you know, I, I presented the two different types of treatment, targeted therapy and immunotherapy. Can you speak a bit about the role of immunotherapy in patients who are receiving targeted therapies? What, what, what do we know about that? It's a very great question, and it's a really important question, I think, particularly when we talk about a research panel, because it's an area where I think we need a lot more research. You know, immunotherapies have been a huge, tremendous advance for lung cancer in general, but so far what we've seen is that they really kind of help a different group of patients than the targeted therapies have so far. And I would say that what we've seen so far with immunotherapy and patients with EGFR lung cancers, you know, and other oncogene kind of mutation positive cancers is that the results with immunotherapy Therapy, at least the drugs that we have right now haven't been as encouraging as we'd like to see. And, and this is a really tough thing, you know, for, for us as providers and for patients, there's so much hope and promise in immunotherapy, so much excitement. And it's very challenging to know that these drugs so far haven't worked as well. But I think this is a perfect example of the kinds of areas where we as, as a group are poised to, to help move the field forward. You know, we have a great research program as we talked about in targeted therapies, but we also have a huge amount of research happening in, in immunotherapy therapy with the drugs that are already approved, but new types of combinations, new types of immunotherapy approaches, whether it be, you know, new, new immune targets, new cancer vaccines, cellular therapies, all these different approaches. And I think, you know, we're going to have to get smarter at both in EGFR and another oncogene driven cancers about trying to understand what is it about those, the immune system in those patients that isn't responding quite as well to immunotherapy. This is an area of research, I think, for all of us actually across the different oncogenic drivers. And, and again, this is an area where we have a lot of work to do. And I hope that in, in the future, we're gonna have a lot better immunotherapies, more effective immunotherapies for our patients with EGFR and other, and other oncogene driven cancers. Great. Um, I see in the, in the questions that there are a number of questions about cellular therapies and questions both about cellular therapies for ALK as well as mesothelioma. Um, maybe uh, uh, both Dr. DeGogo Jack and I can, can take that. I can, I can provide a little bit of an overview and then she can comment on the mesothelioma piece. Um, this goes to, to the slide I showed you about when I said that Cancer immunotherapy is a very, very broad term, and it, and it encompasses many, many different things, vaccines, these checkpoint inhibitors, um, as well as cellular therapies. So, so how do these differ from, from the other forms of cancer immunotherapy? So the, the checkpoint inhibitors, um, these are the drugs that have been approved in, in lung cancer as well as mesothelioma. These are intravenous medicines that are administered as outpatients and, and they really are trying to stimulate uh, immune cells that are within the body, almost blocking one of the breaks on the immune system and get it, getting the immune system to go. <clears throat> By contrast, cellular therapies uh, really um, are, are a very different form of therapy. Essentially what this means is, is actually taking immune cells out of the body of a given patient, genetically modifying them, and then reinfusing them. And the genetic modification is really meant to allow, to basically insert something that is now able to identify a given cancer cell. Um, this is something that has completely revolutionized the management of 
uh, hematological malignities such as you know leukemias and lymphomas um, and you know, we, we've actually started a program in solid tumors over the last several years. Um, you may hear, may have heard about some of these um, cellular therapies such as CAR T cells. That's a specific type of cellular therapy. Um, so, you know, over the next few years, I think this is going to be a critical area and in an area where we clearly want to grow. And I think there are a couple natural targets. Um, one effort that Dr. Lynn and I are working on together is, is actually for ALK positive lung cancers to tr try to design a cellular therapy against ALK. ALK is a unique target in that normally it's not expressed elsewhere in the body. It's only in the setting of these rearrangements that, that it's really aberrantly expressed. And that's important because when you de design these cellular therapies, they don't really have an off switch they're kind of automatically on, which is the power of them, but you need to also make sure that what you're targeting really isn't expressed anywhere else. Fortunately, um, in the Cancer Center, this is one area where, where we can actually leverage all of the expertise across the Cancer Center. So Marcella Moss, who was recruited from Penn several years ago, is, is really a world leader in cellular therapies and designing new ones. Um, and so maybe with that segue, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Dagogo Jack. You know, there was a comment, a uh, question about targeting mes mesothelin um, and the questions and, and that it sounds like, you know, other, other um, centers have not had success with that approach. Can you comment uh, about how that, that might still be a target? Yeah, I think that it's a good question and I think a very insightful question. And so for people who don't have background in the area, so ideally when one develops a uh, cellular therapy or something that you seek to target, you want something that's uniquely expressed on cancer cells versus normal cells or overexpressed or expressed at a higher level basically on a cancer cell compared to a normal cell. Because if you had normal cells that express it at a high level, you would get more toxicities. You would get basically the whatever cellular therapy you give might attack the normal cells as well. And so there's been a lot of interest in mesothelin as a target because it is overexpressed in cancer cells, including kind of ovarian cancers, but in particular in mesothelioma and subsets of mesothelioma, particularly well-differentiated mesothelioma, the epithelioid subset that approximately 80 to kind of 85% of people with mesothelioma will have. And to date, there's been various strategies that people have tried to target it, including just routine vaccines, but also smarter ways to target it, kind of designing smarter T cells, CAR T cells to bind to that target. And you know, you've highlighted, you know, there's been some, uh, to date, there haven't been a lot of kind of home run successes using vaccines, but there's a lot of emerging data that it looks very promising to me where you use kind of uh, complementary approaches, whether or not you need checkpoint inhibitor plus a CAR T cell, or whether or not you just need to develop smarter CAR T cell constructs. And that's why we're particularly excited about working with Dr. Mouse here. They have all sorts of uh, d developments and all sorts of things they can do to optimize a CAR T cell. And we look forward to working with her in this arena. Great. Um, so Dr. Lin, um, there were a few related questions um, that I was hoping you could weigh in on. Um, and um, one of them is, is just on the overlap um, between ALK and ROS1, and then perhaps you could also weigh in on uh, what do you see as evolving strategies to target uh, ROS1? Sure. Um, so in terms of the overlap between ALK and ROS1, for patients that are newly diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer, we do tend to think of these ALK ROS1 fusions and some of the other fusions that were mentioned as a mutually exclusive, meaning that if you have an ALK fusion uh, that is the major cause of your lung cancer, then we don't think of generally seeing also ROS1 fusion that's present concomitantly. However, increasingly we are seeing that in the setting of resistance where the tumor cells have figured out a way of escaping that specific targeted therapy that's being administered, we can see an overlap um, of the drivers. For example, in you heard about Dr. Piotrowska's work where in EGFR mutant lung cancer, progressing on targeted therapy with EGFR inhibitors, there can be red fusions. And so 
that those are the contexts in which we may see two different oncogenic drivers uh, co-occur. A lot of the ALK uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are currently available also do have potency against ROS1, and that has to do with the homology or the similarity between the ALK and ROS1 proteins. In fact, I would say there are fewer um, ALK1, uh, ALK inhibitors that do not have activity against ROS1 than otherwise. Um, and so there is indeed a lot of overlap in terms of not only the, the therapies that we use in clinic, but also in how we think about studying their biology and general treatment paradigm as well. In terms of the evolving treatment options for ROS1, uh, currently we have two FDA-approved targeted therapies for ROS1 rearranged lung cancer. However, after uh, cancer gets worse on these existing approved therapies, we still have very limited options available. In fact, there are no approved therapies for ROS1 lung cancer where um, the cancer has progressed on crizotinib, for example, or entrectinib. Uh, and so reputrectinib that I mentioned earlier in my little uh, five minute uh, um, summary is one of the no newest ROS1 inhibitors that we currently have available in the context of a clinical trial where we have seen very exciting, promising uh, efficacy in patients that have been on prior crizotinib or entrectinib. And I anticipate that we'll have newer ROS1 inhibitor trials in the, within the next couple of years as well um, at Mass General. Another approach that we are looking into uh, with Dr. Dagogojag, in fact, is the combination trial, right? So the combination trial that Dr. Dagogojag is leading is uh, um, enrolling ROS1 lung cancer patients as well, precisely because we do see a lot of the similarities and overlap in, in the ALK and ROS1 biology. And so those are a couple areas uh, that we are looking forward to in the next year or two. Great. Um, so, so Pretty much everyone has mentioned at, at one point resistance um, or the concept of resistance. And, and we've talked a bit about biopsies as, as trying to elucidate what, what's happening within a tumor. Um, a complementary tool, though, is, is liquid biopsies. And so there are several questions about use of liquid biopsies, uh, both at initial diagnosis over time, um, and, and a question focused on MRD assessment. So um, maybe Dr. Sequest can, can start us off. And then if Dr. Dagogo Jack wants to add anything to liquid biopsies and how we're currently using them. Sure. Um, liquid biopsy is a really general term. It can mean um, a lot of different things. And um, and a lot of us, um, really everyone on this call, studies liquid biopsies in one form or another as it relates to lung cancer. When you're drawing a blood sample, um, you can look, I think the, the technology that's furthest along is looking at free-floating DNA in the blood, but you can also look at cells in the blood uh, that may be uh, circulating tumor cells floating free. You can... Um, look at other components as well. Uh, so there's lots of different components to look at in the blood and also ways of analyzing them. Um, but ctDNA uh, or the free little bits of DNA is really the, the only technology that has progressed all the way to an FDA approval at this time. And we use these liquid biopsies or looking for DNA in the blood um, in many different ways. Um, we can use it at the time of diagnosis, especially if it's hard to get a tissue biopsy to look and see if there's a driver mutation so that we know if the patient falls into one of these categories that we've been talking about, like EGFR, ALK, ROS, RET. Um, we can use it uh, sometimes to monitor patients, um, although that's uh, we don't exactly know the best ways to make decisions yet uh, when we're monitoring a patient long-term. Um, and then someone had asked in the questions about minimal residual disease. So this might be after a patient has surgery for an early stage cancer, can we detect any um, microscopic disease by virtue of the blood test? Or can we monitor for a relapse by uh, monitoring for residual disease in the blood? And we have seen that um, 
some of the technologies, probably not the ones that are already FDA approved, but some enhanced ctDNA technology that really is ultra sensitive to look for very, very fine amounts of DNA, that that can be used to monitor um, recurrence. What we still need to show is exactly how we treat those patients differently than uh, patients with no detectable signal in their blood. Uh, but I think that the future for these liquid biopsies is amazing. Uh, there are so many possibilities between um, learning how to monitor when brand new drugs in phase one trials are working or not working at the earliest possible time point, understanding what drives resistance to targeted therapies, screening for lung cancer. Uh, you know, there's a million possibilities of how these new tools can be implemented in the clinic. Great, thank you. Um, we have so many good questions. I, I, I wish we had more time, but I, I recognize we, we are coming up to the, 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 the hour. Um, but so maybe in the last minute or so, I, I, I wanted to um, ask a question and have every panelist uh, a answer it. Um, and, and also, um, I, before I do, I, I wanted to thank everyone again for, for your attendance tonight. Um, for those of you who, you know, where we didn't get to your question, you know, um, Keith and, and, and our development team, we can certainly um, find ways, ways to make that happen. Um, we're, we're really happy you chose to spend the hour with us. And in, in the last few minutes, the question I wanted to pose to everyone in the group is, Really, what do you see as if you had that crystal ball as the biggest advance in the next five years, uh, what would it be in your mind? So we'll start with Dr. Pietroska. I don't know if it's easiest or hardest to start first, but sure, I'll take it. Um, you know, I think it's a really important question and, and I think it's, it's incredible to see how much, you know, lung cancer has changed in the past 10 or 20 years. I think, you know, it's, it's really, sometimes people ask why I went into lung cancer and there's just so much, so many exciting things going on. And I think there, are, you'll probably get many really interesting answers to this question from the panel. I would say that I think what we, what I hope will continue to happen is something that, that Dr. Gaynor alluded to at the beginning, which is this kind of change in paradigm from one treatment for every patient to better and smarter ways to really tailor our treatments to patients. And I think we're already seeing that with personalized therapies for, for different you know, types of lung cancer and different subsets of lung cancer. But I think more and more what we need is rather than a one size fits all approach, better and smarter biomarkers to help us really figure out more than just, okay, your cancer has EGFR or ALK or your cancer is a small cell lung cancer but smarter ways to be able to say, this treatment is really the one for you. And even when you're on treatment, biomarkers to tell us this treatment is working or this treatment isn't working, you know, whether that be through a liquid biopsy or through some other markers about, you know, molecular markers of that cancer to be able to say, this is really the treatment that's gonna give you the longest time on this treatment, or maybe even in the future, you know, this is really a treatment that's gonna be able to help us control this cancer for a much, much longer time. But I think those biomarkers, those ways of understanding how treatments are working and how to tailor therapy are the, the wave of the future and are gonna help us really be able to select the best and safest treatments for our patients with the least side effects and the best outcomes. Great, Dr. Lynn. I actually have two things I want to mention, and they get at kind of two different um, aspects of cancer care. One is um, in terms of really looking at outcomes. Uh, now we're with immunotherapies um, in those subset of patients that respond really well to immunotherapies, even those with metastatic cancer, we're beginning to see that tail end of the curve where patients are really able to live with cancer um, for several years. And, and I think if we can try and reach into different modalities of therapy for our uh, for patients and uh, really optimize that sequencing of therapy so that that tail end can be increased. Um, that would be one of the most exciting things to see in the next five years. In parallel, I, there is a lot of effort going into um, broadening um, molecular testing, not just at uh, academic referral centers, but in the broader community. There are so many patients still that do not get appropriately diagnosed with uh, actionable targets in their lung cancer. And I think over the next five years, my hope is that that really changes and that uh, 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 most, if not all of our 
uh, uh, communities are, are getting the appropriate testing at initial diagnosis so that all these advances that we've talked about tonight uh, can reach the broader patient population. Dr. Dugogo Jack? I too have to, to mention. And so, <laughs> so I think, you know, uh, our experience with the pandemic has made apparent that, you know, just because you live in a different state doesn't mean that you should you cannot access care elsewhere. So I think that this new virtual universe, I really think has ushered in a new wave and has also actually allowed for more kind of richer partnerships between patients and providers. And I think kind of leveraging our partnerships with our patient uh, advocacy groups and, and learning. There's some things that we think are t t well tolerated, but we learn from our patients from co surveys conducted amongst themselves that they may not be well tolerated. So I think there's a lot of fertile ground for that type of research. And I think the other area that I'm very excited about is applying some of these advances that we've applied to the metastatic setting to our locally advanced, so our stage three or uh, stage two, to improve outcomes for those patients. So we're actually achieving cure at a higher level. Dr. Seacrest? Hard to follow all these wonderful uh, ideas for the future. I think building on something to Dr. DeGogo Jack just said um, with this new virtual world, I, I think that technology is finally arrived in medicine. Of course, medical science and medical research has always been at the forefront of technology, often developing new technology that then comes into our regular everyday life. But in the clinic, anyone who's ever been <laughs> in a medical clinic knows that we often communicate by fax or, you know, a lot of a lot of examples like that about how sometimes clinical medicine is not up to date with the newest technology. But both because of amazing advances um, in, in computer science, as well as the pandemic, which has kind of forced our hand, I really think that the care of lung cancer patients is gonna be revolutionized by technology um, over the next five years, not only in how we interact with our patients, but how we can use technology to predict better outcomes and choose better therapies um, for our patients in, in real time in the clinic. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a fabulous point because, you know, um, you know, I think one of the, the ways that we're investing as a program is, is also on things like artificial intelligence. How do we actually leverage that data? Um, both, you know, when you're aggregating all of this genomic data, all this radiographic data and pathology data, there's so much that just the human mind can't connect. And so actually working with you know, computer scientists, computational biologists, and really putting it all together, I think it is really the future. So uh, again, I wanna thank our, our four panelists for, for joining me this, this evening. I wanted to thank uh, all of you at home for attending. Um, thank you for sending in the questions. They were phenomenal and I'm so, so sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but, but again, we, we wanna thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and thank you to our development office for helping us put this together. And, and we look forward to actually having more of these, these webinars. Um, again, trying to leverage technology and the power of technology to bring us uh, closer to you. So with that, I hope everyone has a great evening and uh, thank you so much.